Thanks everybody for coming, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ian Nagoski, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, for about 25 years I've been digging around in old 78 RPM records, uh, buying up stuff that's in languages other than English because I only read and speak English and it seemed like a good way to learn some stuff. Um, turned out that I was right, I learned a lot. Uh, there's lots and lots of them lying around uh, about 15 years ago, I started going around doing something like this, giving talks where I would uh, play a record and tell a story and play a record and tell a story, stuff like that. For about 10 years now, a little more, uh, I've been presenting stories specifically just about immigrants to the United States from uh, the Near East, speakers of Greek, Armenian, Turkish, uh, Arabic, um, And tonight, I'm not going to be doing that exactly. I'm going to be doing uh, sort of something else, which is just to tell you one story about one person who I got interested in. I got interested in her the same way I do about pretty much everything. I just happened across a record, put the needle on it, and thought to myself, oh my god, who are you? How did you do that? Why did I not know anything about you before? And then type into Google the name that's on the label of the record, and go, oh, nobody knows. Nobody. This is not out there. Huh, I wonder if this is a story worth telling. And then, 10 years later, here I am saying that yes, it's a story worth telling. It's about a woman named Zabel Penosian. Uh, I wrote a book about her. Thank you to the folks who uh, bought a copy. Um, it's my first book. Uh, what happened was, as I was doing all this stuff on the Near Eastern immigrants, I came in contact with a guy named Leo Sarkeesian, who was at the time 93 years old when we met, uh, about 10 years ago. He was just retiring then from, uh, he was the oldest living federal employee at the time, uh, had been hired to the Voice of America by Edward R. Murrow in 1963. Um, he was at the time living in and doing recording in uh, West Africa. Um, Murrow said, oh, well, this guy will know how to broadcast African music to African people. And that's what he did for decades and decades. But Leo was from uh, Haverhill, Massachusetts, north of Boston, grew up in a trilingual Armenian, Turkish, English-speaking household. Anyway, Leo lived a long, amazing life. Um, and when we were talking, he said, uh, hey, do you want my old 78s? And I said, yes, <laughs> I, I do, I, I would love that. I mean, if you would feel comfortable. He said, good, you take them. Thank you so much, Leo. And so I dragged these boxes of old records into my car and I drove them home and started listening through them. And they were about half records he bought here in New York City in the 1940s and 50s, and about half records that his father and uncle bought in uh, the Boston area in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, bunch of good records in there. There was one, there was a Columbia disc with an orange label and it was broken, it was cracked, but it still played through okay and I put the needle down on it. And the first thing I heard was a string quartet and piano, which is generally, uh-oh, this isn't gonna be good. This is some middle class bullshit, aspiring values and you know, hmm, okay. And then the voice comes in and I went, oh, well that's pretty. Isn't that nice? She's quite good. And then she did a thing, and my heart stopped. I said, oh my God, that's, 
that's impossible. This person can't do that. And that's the record finished. I picked the needle up and did it again. Did it again. Did it again. Stop me cold again. Uh, okay, so what are we dealing with here? Over the course of 10 years, I wrote about her. Uh, I came up with a couple of biographical sentences for a CD project I was doing, published that. Through that, I came in contact with a, a researcher in Detroit named Perry Kazelian. Brilliant guy, very odd guy, um, in the sense that he has this incredible knowledge, this steel trap mind for names and dates and places of Armenian musicians in the United States during the first half of the 20th century. Um, it's just astounding, his, his recall. And then another guy in LA uh, named Harut Arakalian who had developed a dream of collecting every record an Armenian made in the early 20th century. A uh, very driven person, but who also was somebody who was working at the time uh, partly as a video editor and partly for a private investigator. And he had all these research skills. And so the three of us pooled our research skills together and came up with this story. So that's what I'm going to tell you today is the story about Zahra. She was born uh, June 7th, 1891 in a place called Bardizag. Uh, Bardizag was a town about 80 miles east of uh, Constant Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, about 10,000 people, all Armenians. All of them, 99%. And they did that in the middle of Turkey uh, through a combination of bribery and discretion, keeping their head down, not making waves, and also, once a year, inviting in some Ottoman official, Turkish guy, and giving him a nice dinner and some, something to drink, and then handing him an envelope with some cash in it and saying, now it seems to us that you might want to express to our Turkish neighbors that for the benefit of their eternal soul, it is probably best not to be among us non-believers. Don't you think that that's correct? Don't you think that's better for everybody? And he would go, oh, yes, absolutely. You make a good point. And that way, for 300 years, Zabel's people kept the Turks out of their town. They had uh, silk spinning factories uh, at either side of the main street, and the whole village was surrounded by mulberry groves where the silkworms ate. Zabel learned uh, at the elementary school there in the middle of Main Street. She went to the Sor Hagop, uh, James, St. James Church in the middle of town where she began singing as a child. She worked at the uh, kindergarten for a little while, apparently. Um, and then at eight years old, the first bad thing happened. Uh, she was abducted at night from her bed, put on horseback, and ridden off and made to sing and dance on tabletop for Turkish military men. She was returned home, safely, apparently. Don't know. And then at 11 years old, the second bad thing happened. Her mother died. 15 years old, there's a second abduction attempt. And her father and some family friends keep the guys away from her. And at that point, her father decides, we're going to need to get you out of here. This is not a safe place for you anymore. So 1907, 15 years old, she does not have an international travel passport. The uh, Ottoman government only allowed Armenians to travel internally because they were afraid there was all this revolutionary uh, organizing activity going on. So they were afraid of people going off and doing revolutionary activity uh, outside the country and coming back and you know, uh, attempting to overthrow the government. So uh, she, in fact, was able to travel only to uh, Egypt. And from there, probably family, friends or something, got her passage over to Boston where she was married to a guy from her town named Aram Sarkis Penosian. He was about 10, 15 years older than her. Uh, and right about that time, 1907, 1908, he goes to work for the Tickner Brothers Postcard Company, which was one of the main progenitors of the picture postcard, one of the great developing companies of, of that mass media form in the United States. He did very well. One week after her 18th birthday, she has their daughter, Adrina. Then, there they are in Boston, 
Aram is very supportive of her. He gets her English lessons and uh, singing lessons, first with a couple of guys named Hooker and Graham, uh, who she says taught her basically nothing, and then with a woman named uh, Gertrude Duena, who she said uh, taught her the delicacies of the art of singing. Uh, Gertrude Duena was um, an older lady, sort of in her 60s, who'd been teaching voice there in the Boston area for some decades, and um, Zabel was loved it, loved the lessons, loved the music. It was 1910-ish, the height of opera mania in the United States. Opera stars were what Hollywood stars would become in the 1930s and 40s. It was the height of glamour. That was real high society in the United States. There were in New York City two opera houses. Uh, one sprang up in Philadelphia, one in Chicago, and one in Boston, right about this time, 1910. It was opened by a guy named Otto H. Kahn. Um, if you've seen the Marx Brothers movie Animal Crackers, Roscoe W. Chandler is uh, a just pompous art collector character. That's Otto Kahn, about whom Groucho Marx made jokes till the end of his life. Um, anyway. So he opens this opera house in this kind of cultural backwater of Boston, and he brings all of the best singers. Nellie Melba, Louisa Tetrazzini, Emilita Gallacurci, and Zabel goes and hears this music and loves it and wants to be a part of it. From 1912 on, she represents herself constantly as being of the Boston Opera Company, which is baloney. She never sang in the Boston Opera Company. The Boston Opera Company only existed for four years, and it's all very well documented, and she didn't have a part in any production. She might have been able to dress up in a costume and um, you know, have a walk-on role in the chorus somewhere, maybe, maybe not. Maybe she didn't know anybody who ever had a box seat. But she went, she saw it, she loved it. 1912, she really kind of starts performing, so she's about 20 years old in the Boston area. Um, first performance is with a, uh, a women's minstrel show. Um, but through 1913, 1914, she's singing often for the um, Armenian-speaking community in the Boston area, of whom there were many. Um, therefore, Leo Sarkeesian's father in Haverhill, working at the Leatherworks, having these records. So, um, By 1914, she's so popular that she has to take an ad out in the local Armenian language newspaper asking people not to use her name uh, in advertisements of events that she's not actually appearing at. So that's some measure of popularity, I would say. So 1914, 1915 happen. Things are getting worse back home. By April 25th, 1915. What happens in Bardizov, the town she's from, is that all of the young men have been conscripted into military service doing road construction work, and all of the Armenians have had their guns taken away from them. And then the government rounds up 36 key Armenian figures, intellectuals, doctors, lawyers, dentists, a musician, a composer, ethnomusicologist, and priest named Gomitas Vadarpa. Gomitas was the patriarch of Armenian music through the, all of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They round up these 36 key intellectual figures in the Armenian community in Constantinople, Istanbul, and arrest them. Put them on a train, send them off to a uh, prison uh, outside of Ankara. And then, in Zabel's town and in many Armenian towns around Anatolia, they come knocking on the door and first they round up the, uh, the leaders of the community and they take them off somewhere and they beat them physically, cane them. Now this is not like in Indonesia in the 1960s where they take you off somewhere and they pour soapy water down you until you vomit and vomit and vomit uncontrollably, but there's no evidence of having been tortured. This is we're just going to beat the leaders of the community so everybody knows there's violence on the table. That's what you're up against, violence. And then they go to everybody and they say, here's what you're gonna do. 
you're going to take all your rugs, all your furniture, everything you own, and you're going to bring it out onto the street, and you're going to sell it all to whoever wants it. We're going to invite everybody from the neighboring towns and villages. They're going to come in. They can pay whatever they want, a pittance, and take it all away because you're going to need that money right now to pay to us, the government, for your deportation. You're leaving, and you're paying us for it. And then they put everybody on a train, to another train, to another train, to the Syrian border, where one and a half million Armenians were marched south into the desert and died of thirst and famine and exposure. Women on these marches, girls, villagers would come out and see them marching by and ask the guards in charge, how much for that one? And the guards would just sell them. So that's 1915 back home. Zabel and the other Armenians in the United States are starting to get news about all this, that everything has gone terribly, terribly wrong, and there's no home to go back to, and everyone you ever knew is probably dead, and everything you ever saw is probably gone. In Bardizov, they uh, destroyed the mulberry groves, they destroyed both of the factories. They went into the homes. Everybody had to turn in their keys. Went into the homes and tore up all the floorboards. By the beginning of 1917, from a population of 10,000, there were 36 people left in Bardzov. Everything was gone. Zabel and everybody else in the US is finding out about all of this and freaking out and needs to do something to help. She spends from 1915 through 1919 touring relentlessly, uh, giving benefit concerts, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And she raised millions of dollars by herself in benefit of a um, Near East Relief. The Near East Relief campaign in the United States was a massive philanthropic effort that um, impressed upon the minds of generations of Americans that the word Armenian is always preceded by the word starving. Give for the starving Armenian. Give for the starving Armenian over and over again. And people's so that a friend of mine grew up in the 1950s was told as a kid, eat your vegetables, don't you know they're starving Armenians? Half a century later. So I was a kid in the 80s and it was Ethiopians. Same thing, right? Reduction of the whole country or nationality into uh, its suffering. Anyway, Zabel works and works and works. Um, she finds out during that period that her father is one of the people who has died of starvation. Another bad thing. Okay, so um, one of the people that she met beginning of 1915 was a singer named Armanag Shamaradian. Shamaradian was a guy who had uh, studied under Gomitas, the guy I said was the big patriarch of Armenian music at the end of the 19th century, studied with him in Georgia and connected with him periodically through his career. Uh, Shamaradian was also a revolutionary and had been arrested twice for revolutionary activities. Um, had been The second time he was freed just by a guy named Fuad Bey, a Turkish military guy, said, oh, you're a nice musician, young man. You go home to your village. You teach a choir in your village, and you'll be fine. So he manages to get out through this one individual's beneficence. He teaches there, very poor, for several years, finally makes it out of this village, off to, um, to Paris, where he studies at the Stolara, uh, Stola Cantorum under Vincent Dondi. Same class as Eric Satie, is that what it's called? When Satie went back to school as an older man. Um, and he gets private lessons from a woman named uh, uh, Viardo, who was a 90-something-year-old Armenophile who'd already written a two-handed uh, uh, Armenian suite um, and whose family went back to Mozart, an old musical family. So she teaches him for free. He gets music lessons. And then he gets his big break, uh, stars in Gounod's Faust at the Grand Opera in Paris and becomes rich and famous literally overnight, tours all over Europe until 
1914, he goes back to Istanbul, Constantinople, meets up with Gomitas just before 1915, and they make a bunch of records together. Um, Gomitas plays piano, uh, Shamaradian sings. I'm going to go ahead and play you just a minute or two of one of those recordings. This is a, uh, uh, a song called Grunk, means crane. The lyrics go, um, Crane, where are you coming from? I am servant of your voice. Have you any news from home? Hasten not to your flock. You will arrive soon enough. It was, at the time, at least 300 years old. The oldest known text is identical, and uh, we have it in Aleppo, Syria. Cranes fly north to south, so an Armenian who's in Aleppo is speaking to a crane from further north, historical Armenia, and he's saying, you know, tell me what's going on back home. I miss it. I'm away from home now. So anyway, it's a very famous song. Uh, Gomitas had collected it as part of his ethnomusicology work. He published several volumes of Armenian songs uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So this is the two of them uh, performing that song in the version that uh, Gomitas played them. 1914. So that's Grunk. Shamaradian uh, in 1914, well, World War I breaks out. He can't go back to Paris. It's the war's on. So instead, December 1914, he, his wife, and his daughter come to the US through Ellis Island. Very early 1915, he meets Zabel Pinozian, and the two of them begin doing benefit concerts together. Syracuse, New York, Detroit, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, bunch of places. Generally speaking, he's the star. Big famous opera star from Europe, right? And she's the opening act, and she does two or three songs. She always sings Grunk, and he never does. Because Grunk is her song. But her Grunk is a completely different song. And that's the record that I heard from Leo Sarkeesian's box of records. Um, 1915, 1916, they're playing and playing and playing and playing. 
end of 1916, uh, she goes to Victor Records in Camden, New Jersey, and makes a trial recording for them, and they turn her down. Right after that, Shamaradian goes and makes a trial record for them, and they turn him down, too. So a few months later, February, uh, March 1917, she goes to Columbia Studios here, Manhattan, uh, the Woolworth Building, then the tallest building in the world with a uh, bunch of elevators that were run uh, six days a week using coal, with guys shoveling coal in the basement. Anyway, so Columbia had their studios there. She goes to them, and she records uh, a handful of songs, about a half dozen songs, March 1917. Among them is her... Um, so I'm just going to play you the whole side right now. It's a record that I dearly love and dearly love to be able to share. It's kind of a privilege for me to be able to play this for people. Um, what do you need to know about it going into it that I haven't said already? Nah. That's enough. Except Zabel's other records, which are very, very good. They're very good. But that one's something. 
In fact, there are a number of croaks that she recorded. Now, you'll notice totally different melody, totally different mode from the one Shamaladian sang, right? Because she said it was a song she learned from the lips of her countrymen when she was a little kid. That's the version specific to Bardasan. And there's only one other guy who has ever recorded that melody, and he was from Izmit, the next town over. Next Armenian town over, actually. Partially Armenian. So anyway, it sold like hotcakes. Sold thousands and thousands of copies. Armenians were a very small uh, immigrant population in the US, Sm vastly smaller than the Greeks, who were vastly smaller than the Italians. They sold thousands and thousands of copies. Stayed in print from the end of 1917 until 1931 when Columbia Records deleted its Armenian language catalog. It was the record of a generation. It meant everything to people at that time because it expressed exactly the situation that people were in. What's going on back home? Tell me what's going on back home. Here I am, stranded and missing it and knowing that there's bad news and being in this state of sorrow. That curve, when people do that cross-culturally, that's a lament, that's a sob. That, ah, that's what happens, that's what you do when somebody dies is make that sound. If you're allowed to make a sound on your own without somebody telling you what to do, you will make that sound or something like it. Everybody knows what that is when you do it. It's sad. So um, it, it, was a, it was a big hit. It, so by the 1930s, there was a guy named uh, Hago Basadorian, who was born in 1903, wrote an article called The Gardens of Our City, where he described a barbecue in Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx, and a typical scene there. He said that gradually the smoke of barbecued lamb would saturate the atmosphere and mix with the other smoke of burning memories. At that point, joining the mixture would be the sonorous voice of Shamaradian singing Hayastan, pouring out of the throat of a morning glory, that's a, a horn gramophone. And then you would hear the grunk of Zabel Aram Panosian, and especially the Turkish language Anduni, it's like an immigrant song, uh, Egen Hevasi, springing forth with sad fluctuations from the depths of Kemen Menas's soul. So those are three records, all made in 1917. Zabel's grunk, uh, Kemeni Minas's Egan Havasi, great record, um, and Shamaradian's Hayastan, which is the Armenian word for Armenia. To this day, if you wind up with a pile of records from an Armenian household who had family of that generation living in America, you will always find those three records. Now, the grunk that you will find by Zabel may vary because she recorded it March 1917 five times, which was unheard of, especially for an immigrant. A, it was recorded for the E series, the ethnic series that Columbia was putting out, started in 1908. And generally speaking, what would happen is that a, any performer, not just an immigrant, but anyone, they would record two takes. There's a master and a backup. Whichever one they issued didn't matter. They had not yet invented the idea of a best take. It was whichever one you take off the shelf make the record from that, right? So Zabel shows up at the recording studio, the Woolworth Building, with sheet music, gives it to the musicians, the studio musicians, and makes them do it over and over again to get it right. Now that was take two, as a matter of fact, is my favorite take. It is almost exactly like takes one and four and five. Because Columbia kept pulling it off the shelf and just putting out whichever one. Um, it took me years to figure that out. But the reason I began to figure it out at all is because she re-recorded it when she went back to the studio June 1918. And when she re-recorded it June 1918, she did it much slower and with a little Tweety Bird effect at the beginning, a little sound effect. You put the needle down and there's this little like <laughs> thing that happens. And it's a major third higher when you play it at 78 RPM. And it's not as good. And I went, why is there this inferior version circulating? Why am I running across this bad grunk when I love this record so much? And it took me years and years and years to finally realize 
that when she re-recorded it, she thought she was making a 12-inch disc. And Columbia realized that Armenians would not pay $1.25 for a 12-inch, but they would pay 85 cents for a 10-inch disc. So they sped the record up in order to get the grooves to fit on the side. And then when you slow it down to the right pitch, her voice has improved in a year and a half. Her voice had gotten better. She was singing and studying and studying. Now, why was that? Well, one reason was, let's say, a bad review that she got. A guy who had seen her sing uh, in, uh, what was it, 1918? Uh, why do I want to get the date so correct? It doesn't matter. It's, it's in between that period, right? 1918, 1919, somewhere in there. This guy, Prof Kalafian, who was an important uh, singer, composer, choral director from you know, Ar Armenian. He studied at the Scola uh, Cantorum, went to see one of these benefit shows that Shah Maradian and Panosian did, and wrote a review of it um, praising Shah Maradian, but writing of, uh, he says, the Madame sang Armenian, French, and English songs. Now this is important, is that she was getting up and singing by this time a combination of Armenian folk songs and Western opera. Um, she's singing a lot of, lot of opera at the same time. Singing uh, Armenian, French, and English songs, among which she had her greatest success with the Ala Turka version of the song Grunk. It is with boundless pain in the heart that I say this because at this moment when every single Armenian that wants to be Armenian is working, is striving to shake off from himself all the filthy traces of large and small influence which the Turk has left upon us at this moment when we are going to work to turn back to the Armenian faith all of our holiness that has been subjected to the peril of the Turkified and Turkifying at this moment when we have already vowed to liberate Armenian song from the foreign-induced monstrosities and the holy couplings of our Armenian mind and Armenian soul, we are awaiting the sacred conceptions of tomorrow's Armenian music. That's all one sentence. Just at this moment, I say it truly, it is not correct to still continue the old mistakes. It is not correct to immortalize these slaughters perpetrated by Armenian kanaris. Uh, that's professional Arme uh, Ottoman singers, with the bizarre logic of all of our, and then he uses some slang referring to stereotypes of middle-class Armenians. Coming to Miss Z. Panosian's voice, it is delicate enough, although a little nasal, but it is very small for singing classical pieces, and I would honestly pray that the madam would dedicate herself to the cultivation of operetta singing in which she could have some success. Brutal, brutal stuff, especially she's 25, 26 years old, and here's this like grand old man, and I mean grand, he was a total jerk, totally pompous guy in a top hat with a big wax mustache. Years later, William Sarayan uh, in uh, Fresno uh, wrote that Prof Kalafian, when he founded a choir there, was hated by the members of his own choir. I mean, he was a total pain in the ass. She reads this review of Prof Kalafian and she doubles down and goes to work and gets better and gets better and gets better and better over time. Um, there's another very good review that I'll point out. Um, I believe published here in Brooklyn that begins, uh, just because you're popular doesn't mean you're good. When Zabel, vo uh, Zabel's, uh, Zabel Panosian's vocal tone is beautiful and it is as uncultivated as a flower in an untouched forest. Nature gave her the gift which needs to be cultivated to blossom to its full beauty if she focuses on European songs. This is what I thought when I accompanied her three years ago on piano. So the writer is a pianist who has accompanied her in 1916, and he's now writing in 1919. So I went to the concert on February 9th, and up until now, Zabel Panosian was well known for Armenian songs, which she sang in true Armenian style. All right, Prof Kalafian says she sings to Turkish. This guy says she sings Armenian. Anyway, the writer then focused on her English and the reaction to Meyer Beer's shadow song was overwhelming. People applauded it more than the Armenian songs because she was able to display her vocal talents more. Her voice competed with the flute. Her technique was great. At one point, her voice and the flute were so harmonious that one thought it was two flutes. She produced these notes with clarity and ease. It's obvious she's better trained than she was three years ago. For her performances of Armenian songs, to her compliment, she didn't alter them, but instead showed a better grip. Natsa Shun, a song that she never recorded, by the way, was the best received. It is fair to say that she has the best Armenian female voice. 
In her singing style, one can hear oriental warmth and color. She strongly speaks to Armenians and awakens memories from home. Well, there you go. By 1919, she's gotten very good. Now, she's good enough that the Musical Courier, which is like the big uh, opera magazine, writes a feature on her, right? The Western classical establishment has taken notice and gone, hey, this Armenian girl, she's not just for singing at these benefit concerts, which she's been doing in front of people like Calvin Coolidge and all of these you know, kind of celebrities and literary figures who are showing up to show their support for the Armenian people. They hear her and they go, well, you know, actually she can really sing. Um, so the, she's getting what she wants, which is not to be just an ethnic performer, not just to be in that ghetto, right? The starving Armenian. She gets a role at the end of 1919 uh, singing uh, in a, a musical spectacular, 300 chorus members, 500 dancers uh, called the, um, it's based on the uh, biblical book of Kings, David and Solomon. She plays Abishag. Anyway, she gets a real role. Um, yeah, she's getting better and better all the time. And it's right at that point, very beginning of 1920, that she makes this, this decision and gets a passport. And so she's going for three months. She's going to go to Constantinople, to Egypt, and to Europe to meet up with family, if possible, uh, to find family, is how she puts it, and to do some musical work. Now, by this time, her celebrity has grown to the point where uh, Shamaradian is now her opening act. And the fact of the matter is, we don't know if the two of them ever saw each other again after having had this collaborative relationship for several years. His records sell very, very well. And, you know, he records for Columbia in the US as well. But beginning of 1920, she and her 11-year-old daughter get on a boat, and they go first to England, London, Manchester, and then Paris, where she sets up at the Hotel Vernet near the Champs-Élysées. I visited there recently, gave them a copy of the book. Um, five-star hotel with a Michelin star restaurant. Nice place. Um, so she sits up there for what winds up being three and a half years. The first thing she does when she gets to Paris, basically, is track down Gomitas. After Gomitas was arrested, uh, April 24th, 1915, uh, he, on the train journey on the way to the prison camp, uh, he begins hallucinating and getting paranoid. And from that point forward, for the rest of his life, he suffered from uh, what we would now call PTSD, you know, depression, and mental in, uh, problems for the rest of his life. He was institutionalized in Constantinople after he was released for a couple of years, and then spent the rest of his life in two different psychiatric facilities in Paris. That's where Isabelle goes and finds him. They did not want her to visit, but she was insistent and she wrote an account of it. It is the only first person account. It is the only thing we have of her speaking in her own voice. Uh, my two collaborators, Harry and Harut, don't remember which one of them it was that found it in the Armenian language newspaper from Paris, uh, La Renaissance it's called in, 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 in French. Um, I think it's uh, Harry, he doesn't remember that. Anyway, he translated it. It's the centerpiece of the book. It's the most important thing. Very beautiful document. Um, and it shows her as a, a real artist and a researcher and somebody who is going to the source of what she wants and needs. However, it turns out the source is crazy. And she's very worried about it. She's told by the administrators of the hospital that the last person who came and visited Komitas, uh, he threw his shoes at them. But she insists and she wants to go. So she's very timid about it. She brings with her two guys, two important uh, men, both of whom are doctors. They don't tell Komitas that they are doctors because he hates doctors. And they find him walking around the bushes in the yard talking to himself. And they sort of tentatively approach the stigma of mental illness, you know? What happens? They look you in the eye and then you're crazy too, right? That fear, it's like, a, oh no, the crazy guy on the subway. There it is. But 
Reverend Father is there in front of him. He looks up and he says, hello, you remind me of someone. And she says, yes, I, I'm one of your students, but from far away, we've never met. And he says, where, where are you from? And she says, Boston. And he says, Bostan? Do they grow a lot of vegetables there? Because Bostan is the Turkish word for vegetable garden. And she says, no, and it's very uncomfortable. And she has to change the subject uh, and think of something to say. And he says, uh, no, 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 no. Um, actually, I'm, I'm here to ask you some questions about music, if that's OK. And he says, well, sure, yeah, anything you like. What Ask away. And she says, well, the music that you composed for choir, is it OK to sing that song, the song's solo for voice? And he looks at her and he says, <laughs> my daughter, if you know and feel the song, sing it however you like. It's all yours. Take it, please. Sometime, you know, uh, she says, oh, well, I'm, I'm really worried about tiring you out. And he says, oh, yeah, well, you know, if you have to go, um, sometime you'll come back and I'll sing for you and you'll sing for me. And she says, I'll do that. And then she leaves and she writes at the end of the article, I hope someday it seems to me that the, the Reverend Father of the Vadar Pit will be cured and together we will all sing again, uh, oh, crane, oh, crane. But apparently she never does go back. She performs a lot of concerts in Paris. Uh, she goes to Egypt and performs Alexandria and Cairo. And then she goes to Milan. And she sings in several big productions, the Barber of Seville at La Scala. The audience yells, long live Armenia, during her performance. They love her. She's a celebrity. She goes back to Paris, gives one more show at the beginning of uh, the middle of 1923, and then she and her daughter, now 15 years old, having grown up on the road, backstage and in cabs and with other artists around, they get on the boat and they come back to the U.S., back to her husband, who, in the meantime, got an apartment in Manhattan at 183rd Street. He opened a little shop selling the postcard stuff. And uh, they're doing quite well. Uh, by this time, her, her sister had made it out and two of her brothers. Neither of her brothers married, had kids, um, both strident commies. Um, and her sister did have kids. Um, and those kids' descendants are the only living members of the family. Zabel's daughter never had children. So it was that about uh, 10 years ago, I wrote an article for the Armenian Weekly lamenting the fact that nobody remembers Zabel Panosia now, that I got an email from a guy named um, Varujan Kar Karats saying, that's my aunt. He had never known that she ever had a singing career. It just never came up, <laughs> you know. So uh, he, uh, Zab well, anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. But 1923, she comes back and America's changed. First of all, uh, technical business, pedantic stuff uh, with the record companies. Copyright, uh, patents have expired on some technical things about making records, so little independent companies have started to spring up, taking advantage of that. Uh, in uh, wh what's West Hoboken, New Jersey, now Union City, uh, there was a scene of Armenian guys who started a bunch of little record labels, uh, Prozekian and uh, those guys. And 1923 is right before the Johnson Reed Act. Uh, I ask this wherever I go. Raise your hand if you know what the Johnson Reed Act is, and one person will. No people in this? Okay, one, yes, <laughs> one. Exa there you go. One person knows who the jo what the Johnson Reed Act is. I would not have known if I were not I in love with these old records. Um, they didn't teach me this in school. They taught me about uh, the Statue of Liberty. You're tired, you're poor yearning to breathe free, send these, you know, the huddled masses, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores, all that. Like, that's America, right? That's what we do with immigration. Come on in. Wrong. Johnson Reed Act in 1924 was a set of quotas for who could arrive to the United States by nationality. Each country had a number. They arrived at those numbers from an 1890 census. It, between 1890 and 1920 was the largest wave of immigration in US history. 1907 is the single largest year of immigration uh, per capita in US history. 
matter of fact, the year that Isabel arrives. By 1923-24, America was changing. A, lot, a third of the immigrants during that period were from uh, southern Italy, a third of them were from eastern and southern Europe, and a third of them were from elsewhere, a lot of places. But so America was kind of changing. A lot of Catholics coming in, boy. A lot of Catholics. So the country went through this wave of xenophobia where they're looking at all these Catholics and Jews and stuff and going, are we really going to let them vote in our election that we fought and died for? Really? No. No. No, we're going to fix this. And what they did, they set up this quota system so that X number of thousand people from Germany could come, uh, X number of thousand from England, Ireland, um, down the line. Based on the census numbers from before the big wave of immigration, right? So that hundreds of thousands of Greeks, Armenians, uh, Syrians had come to the U.S., but then after, from 1924 onward, it was 120 Armenians per year, 100 Greeks, 100 Albanians, 100 Egyptians, 100 Palestinians. That was it. And what it did for the Armenian community is it broke up families, right? They're on the other side and they can't get to where we are. And now what am I going to do? So Johnson Reed stayed on the books and was the law for immigration until 1965, during which period how many people were allowed to immigrate to the U.S. from all of Asia and Africa? Zero. Right? So if you were born in 1940, like my father, like the president, you know, in the 40s, you grew up in the most monolingual, monocultural America there ever was. And when Johnson Reed is supplanted by the new immigration laws in 1965, what winds up happening is that America changes again. All these people come from South and Central America, from Africa, from Asia, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, first decades of the, 20, of the 21st century, and you look at America and you go, this is not the America that I know growing up. This is different. I don't like this, right? The, n the percentage per capita of foreign-born people in the United States between 1880 and 1920 was always between 13 and 14 percent. The current number of foreign-born people in the United States is right about 14 percent. So, just so you know. Isabel comes back August 1923, right before Johnson Reed. It's a wave of uh, paranoia that's going on in the United States about immigration. In Italy, she had used on a couple of occasions her husband's first name as her surname and performed as Zabel Aram. So when she comes to the United States, the first gig she does, she rents out town hall and these big thousand seater theaters and gives performances where she sings a quarter of it in Italian, a quarter in French, a quarter in English, and then a quarter, uh, uh, some in Spanish, and then the last few songs in Armenian. And for each section, she has another costume. So she's emphasizing the international quality of her art. Um, but she, in the Armenian press, gives herself as Zabel Aram with Zabel Panosian and little parentheses underneath so they maybe remember who she is. But in the English language press, for the rest of her life, She's Zabel Aram. Because the Near East Relief Campaign worked so well, and it was the case that starving Armenian, right? If you want to be a real artist, if you're a diva, opera singer, you can't be a starving Armenian first, right? Well, maybe you could. It's not that she turned her back on Armenianness or misrepresented herself. She just took a step back, didn't put that up front first anymore. She performs uh, like crazy through the 1920s uh, into the beginning of the 30s. Gets a manager, gets radio gigs here in New York. Um, she goes on tour in California, 1926, uh, gets in a car accident, breaks her ribs, uh, goes into shock, but she's fine. She's back on stage a month later. Um, actually, about that time, 1926, if the reviews are to be believed, 1926 is really when she's about her best. Right when she's about uh, sort of 31 years old, 32 years old, something like that. She's really peaking out voice-wise. 
but she never records again. Why? Well, partially the record business. Like I said, 1931, Columbia deletes its Armenian language catalog, and she never got signed to any of the record labels as a Western opera singer. Um, which is too bad, because that's when the microphone comes out, 1926. Anyway, by 1932, her audiences are dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. She's playing in private parties for some rich people in Florida. There's like a dog act on the same bill somewhere. Um, it's not the same caliber of venue and audience as she'd been used to back in Europe, certainly. Um, she goes back to Europe actually in 1929 with her daughter and uh, they visit Spain and France and her daughter gets very into Spanish stuff and breaks away from the family in 1934 when she was about the same age that Zabel was when Zabel started her career. Uh, she's about 24, 25 years old. And she goes to Hollywood and is a dancer, a Spanish dancer. She's been studying flamenco dance in the 1920s in Spain. And she appears in three films for the Educational Movie Company uh, starring this new comedian named Bob Hope. And she represents herself as Adrina Otero. And for the rest of her career, until 1969, 1970, she represents herself overtly as Spanish. Always tells the press that her she was born in Boston, Spanish father, American opera singer mother just lies about her Armenianness for the rest of her life. Okay, there's, uh, after the book was published, I was contacted by a researcher in Yerevan who told me a story. Adrina was in uh, Paris in 1936, and uh, there was an oil baron there named Kalus Gulbenkian, big, famous, rich Ar Armenian guy. Uh, his collection is now in Portugal. Uh, that foundation is, in fact, who paid for the printing of the book, coincidentally, the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation. Gulbenkian's in a casino at night, 1936 in Paris, and he looks over at this dancer and he says to the owner of the nightclub, um, betcha she's Armenian. And he goes, no, she's Spanish, Spanish dances. Otero. Otero is a name that she took from uh, one of the most famous courtesans of the late 19th, early 20th century, generally regarded as one of the most beautiful and sexual uh, women in the world at that time. So the implication being that she might have been a daughter of La Belle Otero. Anyway. I'll bet you she's Armenian. Call her over here. She calls her over. Excuse me, madame, if you would. Uh, I, I don't mind to ask a personal question, but uh, are you by any chance Armenian? She says, yes. Good. Come have dinner with us. So she spends, uh, she, after leaving Hollywood 34, she does three movies. She's very bored. She goes to London, gets, uh, becomes a model uh, for a bunch of famous academic artists, uh, then goes to uh, Paris, Berlin, Madrid, back to Paris. 1936, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. In Spain, she's living with an artist who is a friend of Franco's, a fascist. In 37, she's performing in nightclubs and um, presenting herself as Roma, as gypsy. Uh, immediately before, all of the Roma in Germany are being rounded up and sent to camps in a rather striking parallel to what happened to her mother's town. Um, and th you maybe you know the story that uh, Hitler said at the beginning of the final solution, who remembers today the fate of the Armenians? That was one of his justifications for the Holocaust was the Armenian genocide. He said, in 20 years, no one will even remember. Because that's how history works sometimes. So. It was the case that uh, Adrina Otero continued to perform for years in Europe. Um, in 1941, she got on a boat back to the US, to New York City, performing at the Biltmore Hotel the day before uh, the Germans arrived in Paris. So she just made it out. Uh, she becomes a pinup star uh, at, at almost 40 years old. Um, around the US and uh, performs flamenco dance, gets him very involved in the Metropolitan Opera, teaches Rizé Stevens castanets for her career-defining role as Carmen, um, goes on tour with the prima ballerina of the Met, uh, Marina Svetlova, for years. Uh, they go around the US presenting flamenco and ballet in Butte, Montana, and Idaho Falls, and uh, 
Salem, Oregon, and all these Western backwaters that provide all of this culture to the American people. Um, she tours Japan, uh, goes to uh, Argentina and Uruguay with her mother, and her mother performs side by side with her, um, or you know, alternating acts uh, there in Argentina in the early 50s. But by that time, Zabel is, well, let's put it this way. She's over 40 years old. And she's somebody who had been, she was cute. She got her picture taken a lot. And what happens to a woman on stage in their 40s and 50s? It's the same thing all the time, over and over again. Um, they're judged. They're meant to represent something people project upon them. She's wearing these costumes and everything. And you know, your genetics just do a thing where they say at a certain point, you get fat. <laughs> you get gray. You get old. And then, do people still want to look at you anymore? Do they still want to hear what, what it is you can do if that happens as a woman on stage? So that's going on. Her husband dies. And the Armenians in the US, after decades of dealing with this starving Armenian thing and the memory and the genocide and the sorrow and the yearning for home and the political bullshit about the new country and how that's gonna work, they're tired of it. And they're not looking back at that period. They're not thinking in terms of preservation of that period of their own history at that point. So Zabel Penozian gets forgotten, like totally forgotten. By 1932, really, she's pretty much written off. She appears at some <coughs> oh, uh, uh, literary events and things. One thing I had forgotten to do when we were talking earlier, <laughs> we, I, was yammering on at you people, uh, earlier, was I, I read you that review of the guy where he was talking about um, uh, how good her voice had gotten. I wanted to play you something real quick. This is, um, uh, she, she made 11 records altogether, 11 songs. Um, only one of them was in a language other than Armenian, in French. It's a song called uh, Charmant Oiseau. It's from a minor opera called The Pearl of Brazil, composed by a guy named Lucien David. Um, it's a very, very popular song. It's been recorded 1908, 9 or something by Luisa Petrozzini, and it was recorded uh, 1917 by uh, Emily de Gallicurci, who's wonderful. I don't know if you like Emily de Gallicurci or not. I like her a lot. Harry Smith, you know a bunch of folkies in a folk club? You like Harry Smith, right? When Harry Smith died, among his possessions was a collection of Emily de Gallicurci records. How's that for a stamp of approval for you? Harry Smith liked Emily. She's very, very good. She was six months, year, uh, six months younger than Zabel Pinozian was. She was from nobility, from Milan. Um, and here she is singing, this is the last minute of the song Charm a Oiseau, as performed by Emily de Gallicurci. And then I'll play you that same last minute sung by Zabel six months later at Columbia Studios. So you can hear, is Zabel a good singer or not, kind of thing, right? By somebody's standards. So here it is, Emily de Gallicurci. Here's the bell, June 1918.
Isabelle as good as Emily de Gallicurci, one of the greatest singers who ever lived? No, come on, who is? Nobody is. Nobody's as good as Emily de Gallicurci. She's very good. And we know from reviews that she got better as time went on from that. We just don't have any documentation of that. Okay, so the 60s roll around. Um, she's getting to be an old lady. Uh, Adrina is now married to a guy living in Miami, teaching flamenco dance at a ballet conservatory there. Um, Zabel moves into uh, Adrina's old apartment here in New York City um, on Fort Washington Avenue, 130. Does anybody follow me on Instagram? One? Good. All right, you're the only one who will have known this story yet then. Because yesterday, I went on a little tour of uh, Zabel Pinozian's New York City. I went to uh, the home that they lived in on 183rd Street and the Holy See Church, uh, which is only a 10 minute walk away. Used to be the Armenian and Greek community up there. Uh, not anymore, but um, I slid a copy of the book under the door for, for the congregation for old time's sake. It, there's a famous assassination that happened there between warring Armenian political factions, uh, December 24th, 1932, I wanna say. Uh, where the priest was murdered, stabbed during mass. Uh, I think that our, uh, Isabel was probably there. Um, I don't know for sure, but anyway, she lived 10 minutes away. I visited those places. Uh, I went out and saw her grave, found her grave in Flushing, Queens. And I went to her last known address. Um, because Isabel lived till 1986. She was a little old lady when she died. Um, totally forgotten. 19 1972, do you know who Kathy Barbarian is? The rest of you do, okay, somebody who is interested in these things. Uh, even Kathy Barbarian knows there's one roulade she can't sing, goes the Steely Dan song. Um, Kathy Barbarian was a hugely important soprano during the 1960s, uh, who was famous for uh, performing John Cage and the Beatles, as well as Western classical repertoire, and a uh, wonderful person. Uh, married uh, uh, Luciano Berrio, anyway. She gave an interview in 1972 to the composer Charles Amerkanian out in California where she said, once there was an Armenian girl who was very famous, but nobody knows what happened to her. She seems to have just disintegrated into nothing. She's talking about Zabel. Kathy Barbarian knew who she was, but didn't know where she was. That's where Zabel found herself by 1972, living at 130 Fort Washington Avenue. So I went there to take a picture and look around and figure out when the building was built so that um, you know I kind of have the timeline better in my head. So I go inside and uh, there's a, a woman standing there with her cat in a carrier and uh, I've got my phone out and I'm taking pictures. She goes, I got to see, when was this building? She goes, oh, 20s. Why are you taking pictures? I said, well, I'm looking into an a, a old singer who lived here once. What kind of singer? And I said, Armenian opera? And she said, um, was she like, and I saw that and went, oh, that's a flamenco pose. That's Adrina. I said, that's her daughter. She lived here too. And she said, oh, I wish I still had that photo. I had a photo. Uh, they, they threw her things away. There were all these photos and costumes. All went into the dumpster. They threw away her whole life. I said, what year did you move in? She said, 86. The year Zabel died. She wrote to me, that I gave her a copy of the book, and I said, you're part of the story now. <laughs> and I gave her a copy of the book, and she wrote to me this morning, and she said, I found the photo that I had. Oh, yeah. It was blue-green tinted, and it was this photo of Zabel dressed as Abishag for the uh, 1919 production that she was in, holding a vase. That's why she did this gesture. It wasn't flamenco. It was Zabel holding it, so it was Zabel. That they threw away all her stuff in 1986 there on uh, Fort Washington Avenue. What great luck to now know, because I was always worried that Zabel wound up a little old lady in an old folks home by herself, uh, because by the time 1986 rolls around, her daughter is dead. She's fallen out with her sister. There's some kind of family problem. We don't know if it was political, we don't know what it was, but. They didn't get along. Um, her husband was dead. Both of her brothers were dead. 
you cheat it all along. The um, three years before she died in 1982, she uh, <coughs> gave to the Armenian General Benevolent Union, this charity, uh, $756,939, which is almost $2 million in money now. Just gave it to her. In return, they wrote her obituary, which says thus. The extremely well-known and beloved uh, singer of the Armenian-American old generation closed her eyes forever, leaving behind her good name and remembrance-worthy work. Peace be to her tormented soul. So I sent the book to the AGBU, and they said thank you. And what have they done? Nothing. Nobody has. Why should anybody? She was important once. She made a few records. I don't know, man. Is it a failure of uh, Americans to understand the status of immigrants, that the creative work that immigrants do in languages other than English needs to be written into the story of America in order for us to have and carry forward significant creative figures and stories about ourselves that are more rich and complex than the stories that we have continuously told ourselves about Americana and what it means to be American. I think so. I think Zabel's as good as Billie Holiday is. I, I like Billie Holiday a lot. I think Strange Fruit and Grunk are kind of the same record. Pretty close. Is it a failure of the Armenians, of whom I am not one? Incidentally, Armenians have an Armenian word for not Armenian, Odar. An Armenian didn't tell me that because it's not polite. It's like Goyim, you know. It's <laughs> somebody else told me. I'm an Odar. I'm not one. I don't, uh, I don't get a say in any of this. What about the Armenians? Should they be remembering and celebrating this issue? I don't know, man. I know that I want to see her on a postage stamp in 30 years. I do. I think she's worth it. I think she's important. I think she's very good. And it's a real uh, blessing and a privilege to be able to come around and share the story with you all. Thank you very, very much for being so attentive and letting me uh, share this with you. It really means the world to me. I'm very grateful. Thank you.